Please note that all episodes come with a blanket content warning. The books we read often tackle difficult and triggering subjects. We'll include specific content warnings in the description of each episode, so please take care of yourself and check them out. And finally, if you're not comfortable with swearing, now's probably a good time to stop listening. Hi and welcome to Hectic and Eclectic, the podcast for readers whose brains are hectic and whose bookshelves are eclectic. I'm Hope. And I'm Thea. I am a queer, autistic book scrummer and bookseller with ADHD. (laughs) I am a non-binary author um, of horror and other creepy things and I'm also a bookstagrammer uh, and generally just pretty neurospicy. We found other bookish podcasts to be a little bit too formal, yeah, structured and formal. So we wanted to create something that was a little bit more like just sitting down and having a couple with your friends and just chatting shit about books. Yay! Because of varying neuro spiciness, <laughs> we do tend to stray off topic sometimes. Yeah. Um, but we've decided after um, a lengthy conversation to not cut that out yes um because we think that we sometimes enjoy just listening to people chat shit yeah even if they do go off topic a little bit it's fun and um honestly i don't have the attention span to not go off topic yeah so here we are and the places it can go to can be quite funny exactly um so we want to just be a little bit more organic and just let it roll how it's going to roll um, and if you want to listen to and or watch us just like on your commute or while you're doing chores, then you mm. can just listen to the whole thing. Equally, we will do our best to chapter um, the podcast slash video so that if you yeah. do want to just skip to the part that you want to listen to or the, you know, on topic parts <laughs> or bits of specific books, then you can do that too. If that sounds like something you're interested in, keep listening. If not, you should probably leave. Yeah. Should we... Um, should we, should we start? Yeah. I'm a non-binary author. I like to write um, books that are creepy. Uh, <laughs> that's that's the umbrella I'm going to mm-hmm. go for. Um, anything that's sort of like horror, weird, unsettling, uncanny, um, eerie, that sort of thing. I love uncanny. Um, yes. Yeah. I love doing it in uni. Yeah. Oh, my God. It's so fun, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's just like super super unsettling um so yeah so that's the sort of thing i like to write um and the stuff i like to read is like pretty much of the same (laughs) ill um but also including like some sci-fi some gothic um some literary fiction i'm trying i really want this year to get better at reading Mm non-fiction because i find i don't know if you get this but when i read it really helps to have like a narrator kind of voice that I'm reading on the page because I can hear it in my head. Mm. Um, Like when I read, I can hear my voice reading it in my head kind of thing. Um, So often when I read a nonfiction book, even if I'm really interested in in the topic, if it doesn't feel like someone talking to me and telling me a story, I just can't keep up with it. Like there are so many books that I've started reading that I just haven't finished and I think non-fiction books and non-fiction authors are getting better at that as yeah. time goes on for sure mm. because I think they're realizing that oh well the reason that's the reason people find fiction easier to read yeah. right because it's it's easier to di- digest and it's written yeah. in more of like a narrative form where it feels mm. like you're talking to someone mm-hmm. and so I think non-fiction authors are definitely getting better at that yeah and editors are sort of clicking onto it yeah um so yeah and hopefully they're being advised better mm. into like uh maybe you could like write this a bit more of like a story yeah um so or yeah, a bit more think, chatty yeah yeah i think we were talking last night about um jews don't count by david Fadil. oh yeah and he does this really well and i think part of that is because he's a comedian yeah um so he's used to you know telling jokes mm. um that he's pulled out and of having scenarios like, and having like a sort of persona and a yeah. voice that's really really distinctive yeah, rather than just putting that. the information down exactly on a piece of paper. yeah so he must like have that in his head as he's writing yeah and you can help. really tell it is it's very like informal and i just absorb it so much better yeah. i think that's i would i would be pushed to say that's pretty universal mm. that like I know certain people can just absorb information at like a wild rate. Yeah, who just are you like, people? Like how? <laughs> just from like information. Tell me your secrets. But I think most people learn better from being told something more colloquially. Yeah, me sure. too. Me too. That's the same for me anyway. But. Yeah. 
for sure. Yeah. What about you? Um, yeah, so I am um, a queer bookseller and I'm on Bookstagram and BookTok and all those things. I'm, to be honest, I've gotten quite bad at it recently <laughs> um, just because I've just, I guess, fallen out of the habit. Um, and as someone with ADHD, once you have fallen out of the habit, you fucked it. <laughs> um it takes so much effort like I have to I have to like block a day out just to make like one Instagram post these oh days my it's God. a nightmare that is a nightmare um, so yeah I have got a bit, <laughs> a bit bad at it I won't lie um yeah what else I read um I read quite a lot of non-fic I'm yeah, kind of the do. non-fic readers mm. reader in this pair couple scenario <laughs> Um, thing we've got going on um I do like non-fic I with my fiction I tend to lean towards young adult um and specifically gay young adult we love um, to see it yeah for sure um and I like to be honest I like gay non-fic as well mm. um I avoid literary most of the time like the plague yeah um and I'm not into high fantasy oh yeah me neither um which I will be talking about a little bit later so mm. I won't go into that too mm-hmm. much now um but I think I tend to when people ask me what I'm, I read I tend to say like oh a little bit of everything yeah me too you know hence the whole eclectic thing we yeah. do we do have like quite broad taste and then like some real niche random things chucked yeah. in every now and then for sure yeah um I do think are you a TBR reader or a mood reader? Mood reader. Yeah, me too. Unless I've started to, I've had something on my TBR for so long that I feel guilty about it mm-hmm. and then it gets shoved to the top of the list. Right, okay. Yeah. Do you find like sometimes if you're not in the mood for that though, you'll DNF it even though actually if you were in the mood for it, you'd probably quite like it? 100%. I literally DNF'd something earlier because I was like, I'm actually not in the mood for like gothic short stories right now. Mm. I'm going to go for something more contemporary, like contemporary horror. Yeah. Um, and like I read the first story. It was really good. Um, it's Salt Slow by Julia Armfield, which is her first book. Um, and it's a collection of short stories and it's quite, um, quite gothic and quite, um, weird, but I just wasn't really in the mood for it. It's not that it wasn't good. It was really good. Yeah. But I was just like, yeah, no, not feeling it right now. I tend to have a massive stack of books on the go at any one time that I don't know exactly yeah. and also I don't know if this is a neuro neuro spicy thing but I can't commit to only one story at a time because I'm just too like oh but this oh but that okay. shiny yeah yeah, like, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah I'm with you yeah I always <laughs> thought that I was a TBR reader um, and I would make like lists at the start of the year so I'd get mm. to like January 1st and I would make a list of like the 10 books that I definitely wanted to read that yeah, year. yeah. Um, and then the more people started to tell me oh no I'm a mood reader and I would be like oh that ew. sounds good like oh um <laughs> <laughs> but your TBR um <laughs> and then I started to realize that actually I was picking books up and I thought that I was picking them up and then I didn't like them and I was DNFing them and the more I was doing it I was realizing oh actually it's not that I don't like this. Yeah. It's that I'm just not in the mood for it. Mm. Um, and mm. I still do it. Like I'll still pick up books that I like should be quote unquote should uh, be reading. Yeah. Um, especially because of work. Yeah. Um, and you know, there are certain books that um, we're sort of expected to be able to talk about mm. and expected to know about. And so those kind of books, I feel like I should be reading them. Mm-hmm. And so I pick them up. And then I think, I'm just not in the fucking mood for this. Yeah, Um, totally fair. Whereas beforehand, I would be like, this is bad. If it's not catching me, it's because it's bad. Ah, that's really interesting. Um, But actually, I just wasn't in the mood for it. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm getting, I think I'm getting much better at being like, okay, I'm clearly not in the mood for this right now because I'm not clicking with it. Yeah. And putting it down to Mm. come back to. Yeah. Rather than putting it down never to be picked up again. Yeah, I like that. I think one of the things that I would really like to do with this podcast is kind of, um eliminate the shame in our reading habits for sure because like you know you text me earlier and you were like there's a bookstagrammer that we both know personally who's read how many books oh in- god that must it was must have been somewhere between it was a, 10 and 15 it was a fat stack of books yeah, probably closer to 15 yeah 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 
And and none of these Just were like in January. none of these were novellas either. Like no, they were this like person thick. read some <laughs> thick books. Yeah, fifteen of them just last month. Yeah. Um, and you you were like, how the hell does this person have a social life, um, a partner, a full time job, and manage to read this amount yeah. of? And the sh- and the shame is properly real if you're a yeah, bookstagrammer. Like sure. there's a lot of I feel a lot of competition. Yeah, I would. Oh, sorry, Mike. Um, but. I would, <laughs> My bad. That should be on Do Not Disturb. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, the neurospicy moment. I've completely forgotten what I was talking about. Oh yeah, the, the shame. shame. The, the shame. shame. Yeah, but like you know, if you can still be someone who loves books and doesn't read them all the time yeah. and prioritizes other stuff in your life, like yeah. for me, if I try and push myself to read more than I'm capable of taking in and enjoying, you get in a slump. I get in a slump. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to do it. Anymore. So easy to do. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. I sent that post. Like one of these books that um, this person that we're talking about read was um, Stephen King, mm. and it was Holly, um, and that's like it's it's minimum four hundred pages. Yeah, yeah, it's massive. Um, and <laughs> and so they they put this stack on their Instagram, and I was like, I read Uno book <laughs> in January. And it was 170 pages long. <laughs> okay, confession. Um, I read five. Um, and I don't think I've ever read five books in a month. <laughs> yeah. Right. So Not I pushed time. myself. Firstly, I pushed myself because I was like, okay, I'm going to, I wanted to beat last year's story graph stats. Mm-hmm. So I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to push it. Also, I'm unemployed right now. I have the fucking time. Let's be honest. <laughs> I've got nothing better to do. I think you mean fun employed. <laughs> Uh, and um yeah so firstly five books one of them was a short story mm-hmm. one of them was uh, hang on mm, one of them was a collection of short stories that was quite long but i started it in december so i just finished it in january uh-huh, yeah and then i think the other three were novellas so like i wasn't gonna read you know fucking tolkien yeah five tolkien's yeah. in a Month. And it's so easy to be like, oh, it doesn't count. Yeah. The short story yeah. like doesn't count. But it and does. All you have to do is scroll through BookTok for five minutes and you'll you'll come across a BookToker who is like holding a big stack of like novels, <laughs> like <laughs> big chunky books and being like, here's a rating of all the books I read in January. And you're like, <sighs> how? Like, what do how? you do? Do you I, have a life like, you sleep? In it. <laughs> like when how fast also, do you read oh my god we need to talk about this because i am a slow reader Me too. i read at speech pace like i said yeah. i can hear the voice in my head so i read at speech pace yeah but some people are like skim readers yeah, firstly just, how the fuck i should have gained that skill in university yeah me too and here we fucking are so <laughs> <laughs> i mean i'm sure yeah. it's possible but my mum actually um shout out uh, <laughs> my mum um really really loves reading but she learned to skim read because she actually used to work in the publishing industry didn't tell you about this no yeah there you go first first she did that um yeah um she used to work at oh what's it called the the bookseller excellent oh yeah the magazine Yeah, yeah, yeah 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 um so she used to work in that um so she got really good at skim reading and then wasn't able to go back to like having the voice Just in her slowing head. down exactly to read like a good like narrative story so Interesting. i'm scared that if i were to have the skill i would then lose the nice voice and the nice mm. pace and the this is you interesting. Know, yeah interesting. yeah so anyway we're slow readers and um we dnf a lot and um because life's too fucking short not to yeah, dnf that yeah, book it really is it really is if you're not getting on with something dnf don't feel guilty For about sure. it yeah there are so many impeccable books yeah. out there that you could be reading mm-hmm. um, and you're not because you're like pushing yourself to finish this one shit book yeah don't do it don't do it don't do it don't do it so we kind of wanted like to have a little bit of a theme for today which was um our favorite our tops and bottoms if you will of um last year yeah so we're just gonna like chat about what we liked and what we didn't like yeah of what we read in 2023 yeah um what are you reading at the minute um at the minute i'm reading of cattle and men by Ana Paula Maia. Um, I think she's Brazilian and it's translated by Zoe Perry. Um, and it's 
it's only a hundred pages actually, which as as we know is my thing. Um <laughs> I really love a novella. I think like I think it's a really like crazy, crazy skill to create a world in such a short space of For time. Sure. Um, and you can you can either I feel like with novels, you can just be like a relatively good writer mm. and as long as you get everything that you need to get in there and it mm. makes sense and there's no plot holes you like you do it yeah whereas I think with short stories you have to like you have to get it right for sure um, and you can either make like a really good short story or a really bad one you can get short stories really really wrong yeah. um because if you don't it's really easy to not do a story or a character or a, mm. um, a world even not even a world like just this the scene in which your character is yeah if you don't get that right within you know a good like 30 pages kind mm. of thing and you've not clicked with someone yeah you've you've like you've immediately got it wrong 100% um and I think with short stories as well it needs to be it needs to have a really like punchy ending the end yeah. is like vital in yeah, short yeah. stories For sure. um because you run the risk of it just being really unsatisfying yeah for sure of it just like ending my favorite short stories are um have a really punchy beginning not necessarily even like the perfect first line mm. um but oh my god the other thing i'm reading at the moment actually while we're on this topic is um 19 claws and a black bird by agustina basterica um translated by sarah moses and um this woman is the queen of fucking great first sentences um also this book is extremely triggering <laughs> like you know you know how i said i love horror um this this is it right it's it's very she pulls no punches not one um this this story is called a light swift and monstrous sound um and the first sentence is first the dentures fell onto the blue tiles of your patio Righto. Isn't that a fucking crazy first line? Shall I go on? Do you want to, do you want to hear what the fuck's no. actually going on? I don't want no. to hear about these dentures. I haven't, it's it pretty gruesome. It's me out a little oh, bit. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And then, hang on, Roberto is great. Uh, I have a bunny between my legs, a black one. My bunny's name is Roberto, but it could have been Ignacio or even Carla. What? <laughs> okay so so good oh yeah she's just the queen of first lines but yeah that's <laughs> something i really really love about short stories is that there is so much you can do in so few words yeah um and i feel like especially when you've got sort of like horror or eerie or uncanny stories you can just create this this whole world where you can even have like your own sort of rules and make it make sense to a reader in a few pages it's just mad. Yeah. It's mad what you can do. It's an incredible skill. Mm, for sure. But yeah, so Anna Paula Meyer of Cattle and Men. Um, it's quite, um, it's kind, it reminds me of like Cormac McCarthy. Have you ever read any of his stuff? No. So he does a lot of like kind of Wild West stuff um, and a lot of like barren wastelands, yeah. deserts, that sort of like thing. world ending. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, this is kind of it's it's set in the same sort of a place. Like you get the idea that the landscape's very like um desolate and um it's the main character is um working in an abattoir um and his job is the stun operator. So he is the guy that hits the cow on the head or whatever our animal it is to make sure that they're unconscious when they're going to be slaughtered. So it's, it's pretty gruesome. It's pretty gruesome. Uh -huh. And there's like, there's this lawlessness to it. And this, I don't know, there, there's something very surreal about it. That's really, really intriguing. Mm. Um, and like the, the sort of lawless elements are like really, really weird and unsettling, but like, you kind of want to know how it works yeah. and what people can get away with in this world. For sure. So it's really, really interesting. I'm really enjoying it. Like, really enjoying it. I just last night finished They by <gasps> Kay Dick. Okay, that's also on my TBR. Yeah. Um, yeah so it's it's like 172 mm -hmm. pages long mm -hmm. or something like mm -hmm. that. I might be wrong. Um, 
And basically, the reason I found it so interesting is because it was originally published in 1977, I want to say. Really? Yeah, it's really old. Okay. Um, I didn't know that. And it didn't sell well. Oh, okay. At all. Um, The very few reviews that it had at its time of publication were either like really bad Mm. and were just like, like didn't get, didn't get it. Um, and the other one was quite sexist. Um, it was, I think, a male review in the New York Times mm. um, said something along the lines of that it was just basically about of like um, menstrual hysteria. <laughs> Um, wow I, ding, ding, ding. Yeah, if, I, bingo. if I can find the actual quote I'll maybe like edit it in hello future hope here the full quote from the review describes the book as a fantasy sprouting from some collective menopausal spasm in the national unconsciousness oh God, that's funny. Um, but yeah that's basically what it said and then because it was doing so badly um K. Dick went to the publisher, mm-hmm. which is it Faber? I actually I know Faber picked it back up recently, but I oh, think it might okay. have been Penguin. Oh wow! Originally, okay. um, again, might be wrong. Don't quote me on it. Future Hope. If I'm wrong, please edit in here. <laughs> Hi, Past Hope. You are in fact correct. They by K. Dick was originally published by Penguin Books in 1977. Uh-huh. Um. <laughs> Yeah, so um, K. Dick went to the publisher and said, can I have the paperback of my book, please? And the publisher said, um, well, you haven't earned out um, oh, your wow. advance. You haven't earned out your advance. So, In um, sales of the book? Yes. Right, got So it. because of that, um, we would expect you to um, put the money towards your own, your own paperback. paperback. Wow. We would expect you to fund your own book. Um, and so K. Dick basically as- accused um, the publisher of not pushing it enough, not yeah. doing um, enough publicity and sales mm. work on it. Um, and within two years, it was out of print. <gasps> what? Totally out of print. You That's couldn't wild. get hold of it at all. You couldn't get hold of it anywhere. Um, buying a secondhand copy was like near on impossible. Damn. Um, it was absolutely mad. And then um, an editor for faber mm. happened to come across it in a charity shop Ooh. um and the copy was like bad like bad. um yeah the <laughs> there's a foreword in there by the author of i can't remember their name but it was the author of her body and other parties um carmen maria machado yes that one um and she basically says um how this editor said that it was held together by a memory of a spine and I think um, K. Dick died in like 2002. No way. Um, and um, publishers were approached, asked if they wanted to like pick back up her work. Yeah. And they all said no. Really? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, this editor for Faber picked it back up relatively recently um, and republished. Mm. Um, and yeah, I think impeccable and i think just for that reason it should be read yeah me too just because it fell out of print yeah 100 percent. um so it's about it's a dystopia it is described as somewhere between dystopia and horror great i all the boxes it's yeah it's described as that i didn't feel like it fell enough into horror okay for me i felt like um the horror elements of it were just a creepy dystopia okay rather than an actual horror mm-hmm. um, so personally i would say it's just dystopian mm-hmm. um and it's about this mysterious group of people who are only referred to as they mm-hmm. um who want to abolish individual thought um and so they don't like artists no. they don't like writers they don't Quite like right. um, people who live alone mm. Um, anyone guys. who sort of embodies um, individuality, mm, independence, and yeah, mm-hmm. anything like that. Okay. Um, and so it's really interesting. The narrator is um, unnamed, mm-hmm. ungendered. Love that. Yeah. Um, and for all of these reasons, I think is why it didn't do well. Okay. When it was originally published, people just didn't <laughs> get it. No. Um, it was 
I hate the phrase like ahead of its time, but yeah. I think that's what I have to use. Mm. Um, and Where was Kay Dick from? Do you know? Uh, I think the UK. From the UK. Yeah. yeah. I would have to look it up. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, wow, it sounds really good. Yeah. Um, so it's split into very short chapters, which mm-hmm. I found really, really useful. Because you can just read a chapter, put it down. Yeah, read yeah. A chapter, put it down. Mm-hmm. Um, and it definitely time skips. Okay. It's definitely not written in a linear timeline. Okay. Um, I think there's maybe multiple narrators, um, but because they're unnamed and ungendered, Ooh. there's no sort of way of confirming that. Okay. Um, but just from their sort of the way they carry themselves and the way they speak and things yeah. like that, I got the impression that there's maybe multiple. Um, but then that could be that this person has grown over time and because we're not in a linear timeline yeah we can't confirm okay Um, so I think it's really open to interpretation which I love because like I will have a different sort of vibe from it than you will Mm. Um, you know you might think no this is definitely the same person they've Mm -hmm. just sort of changed over time and yeah yeah um so yeah I think I thought it was really really interesting oh nice that sounds really good. I love a dystopia. Yeah, me too. Big fan. Yeah. Do you have a favourite dystopian novel? Yes. What? Tell me. Um, Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. Oh my God, haven't read it yet. Oh, me too. That's one of those books I think everyone should read. Mm. If anyone in work comes up to me and they're like, I really like, I want to get into like dystopia or I've read this one dystopia and I, yeah. I really want to read more. I'm like, Fahrenheit 451. Nice. Impeccable, impeccable book. Um, again for its time it's quite old uh-huh. um and apparently i don't know if this is confirmed i don't think it has been but apparently ray bradbury wrote it in a day um that you would never know it's impeccable i absolutely loved it absolutely loved it it sounds really really good it is it's amazing my oh it's really hard to pick one but just for the absolute classicness of it Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. I've not read it. Oh my God. The writing is just wildly good. Really, really beautiful. Do you know the story? Very vaguely. Vaguely. Um, It's about... It's one of those stories I should know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but (laughs) when you're ready, (laughs) when you're ready, for sure. Because it's rough. It is really, really rough. Um, But it basically, it's like the United States in the future it's become a theocracy so the christian right wing Mm -hmm. have taken over um and they've basically given women um like two or three roles that they can choose Mm -hmm. i say with um quote bunnies (laughs) fuck are they called quote bunnies quote bunnies um (laughs) so um either you can be um like a wife yeah an econo wife as in economic as in lower class right yeah and that's that's your job um or you can be a handmaiden to like the upper classes and basically um you've got sort of like the the generals the men in charge because it's basically like a military coup that's happened um so like the generals have their wives um but it's not the wife's job to get pregnant and give birth um it's more of like a, it's more upholding like the social feminine order yeah. that that's their kind of job. So what the handmaidens do is they're they're basically baby makers, surrogates, yeah, right, great. They, yeah, w- walking incubators, great, essentially, yeah. Um, so <laughs> consent not really a thing in um this world, um, but yeah. So it's from the point of view, it's written like a diary, like a secret diary. Oh, that's interesting. Yes, yeah. from the point of view of this one handmaiden who never gives her name um okay, yeah. for reasons of safety obviously obviously um but yeah very very <laughs> tense the world building mwah, chef's kiss um really really emotional um yeah when you're ready read it for sure yeah very margaret good. atwood is just oh, the the dystopian writer queen, right um, have you read oryx and crake not yet it's on my bookshelf oryx and crake is fantastic <laughs> um i actually read it so in university i did a um, utopias and dystopias module so did i baby um and so that was where i first came across fahrenheit 451 nice Um, and we also did oryx and crake Mm -hmm. by margaret atwood and i can't Mm -hmm. remember anything else we did amazing Um, those are the two that stuck Mm -hmm. um 
we did like Utopia by Thomas More. Oh, so fucking boring. So boring. So boring. So boring. Bless him. Um, but there are not many fic- fiction books that are utopian. Yeah. Because it's fucking boring. Well, okay, so you say this. on So on the unit that I did that was Utopias and Dystopias, we were talking about how... Um, because obviously we're all individuals and we all have our own opinions. One person's utopia could be another person's dystopia. For sure. So, yeah, of course. And and in order to keep something so perfect, how, how are you going to do that? How are you going to police something staying that yeah. perfect? Do you know what I mean? Also, I think the I think the reason that um, there's maybe like significantly, like noticeably less utopian. Fiction mm. is because we can't fucking relate to it. <laughs> yeah, we so are true. living in a dystopia. Oh. Like, prove me wrong. In it, um, and so of course we're going to relate to dystopia. Yeah, more. Do you know what I think we've seen recently in fiction is a lot of um, women writing dystopias, quote bunnies, um, where there are no men, and it makes me think. That's a utopia. Are you writing? Are you really <laughs> writing a dystopia, or are you marketing it that way so that people don't cancel it? Chat me, chat me, but interesting. Yeah. Because yeah. that's a, yeah. I would. I'd move there. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I'd move into that bunker in a heartbeat, mate. Would you give up? Um, would you give up beard to to? <laughs> Should we give some context? No. <laughs> so uh, we've we've come up with um, with code names for our respective partners um, because we would like to maintain some level of privacy for mm-hmm. them. Um, and mine is going to be called Beard, not because he is my beard, uh, but because he has one. Um, it's okay. He's aware I'm queer. Uh, yours is Bean. 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 Because it's his actual nickname. Bean. Beard and Bean. Um, would I give up Beard? Oh, damn. See, I hate to be this guy, but he really is one of the good ones. Yeah. Yeah, he is, isn't he? But you'd have to give him up. He's a man. <sighs> That's so true. Mm. Would you do that for a life with no that. men? Get back to me on that. Um, <laughs> Would you oof. give up one of the good ones for life with none of the bad ones? Not if it was my good one. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> this is like the um the board game we were playing last night. Yeah, if you've carried ever... it into today, <laughs> into this recording. If you've ever played, um, I actually don't know what it's called. I think it's just called the trolley problem. Mm. Or the trolley game, or something. Or the, yeah, something like that. Which is like it's like a philosophical. Yeah. <laughs> Who would you hear? Theory? There's like um so that the actual way to play it is not how we played it, but the actual way to play <laughs> it is that you get various um there's angel and devil cards, mm-hmm. right? So on the devil card you might get um a child that will um grow up to be a serial killer uh-huh. or like is is a serial killer and on the other side you'll get like um a puppy. <laughs> To baby, and you're talking to, about the puppy. Yeah, you normally would put um, one angel and one devil card on each track, mm-hmm. um, and then um, you would normally split into teams to do this. So the team would put an angel card on their track, and then a devil card on the other team's track. Right, and then you also have um, modifier cards. Okay, which are those white ones with yeah, the black yeah. text on. So mm-hmm. they'll say something like. Um, I don't know, the the puppy is like about to go and kill an old man or whatever. Um and so basically the <laughs> each team can put modifiers on either there's good modifiers and bad modifiers, and you can put them on either your track or the other person's track. And the team basically have to battle out um to convince the trolley driver, which changes each round to hit the other track right okay um we did not play it like that at we all didn't. hope was basically just like the evil mastermind <laughs> who would like ask each one of us individually um like who you're gonna hit this one or this one and then just like find, then modify it. find the modifier that finally made made the person change, change their mind, their mind. <laughs> Like they were just collecting data on all our like moral inefficiencies. I'm really time. interested in um, what it would take. I know you were. <laughs> You're just being like this little evil mastermind. It was great. <laughs> so one of them was like, um, 
a, a, a five-year-old's birthday party. Oh yeah, yeah. And I would put the t- I would generally I would put two angel cards down. Yeah. So like, you didn't want to hit either of them. Yeah. Um, and then the other one was the puppy. Um, and so people would be like, oh well. I consider human life more valuable than animal life. And also there's more children. There's like 10 kids <laughs> and one puppy. So by law of averages, like I'm hitting the puppy. Sure. And then I would put a modifier card down that would be like, one of these kids is going to grow up to be the next Hitler. <laughs> um, and then it would be like, oh. No. <laughs> um, and so on and so forth. And I would see how long it took until that person said okay now I'm hitting the party (laughs) (laughs) and I'd be like okay and then I'd move on to the next person um so yeah I just found it really interesting yeah you're a little shit aren't you yeah yeah (laughs) um what were we talking about I don't know I think dystopias hey dystopias Dystopias. oh Um, I have to say there are some utopias um (laughs) that we do have to mention um Ursula K. Le Guin writes, wrote, I think she's dead. Is she dead? I don't know. I don't fucking know. We're going to have to go. Um, Future Fear, please edit. Hey, Past Fear, you are absolutely bang on. Ursula Le Guin did die on January 22nd, 2018. R.I.P. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, she she is, is slash was an amazing sci-fi writer. Yes. And she wrote a lot of dystopias and utopias, often like in a sort of like, science fiction sort of capacity Mm -hmm. so like it might be a whole planet it might be um a solar system whatever um but yeah I read one of her books um the left hand of darkness um when I was in uni and was that the one about the um the intersects yeah yeah it's really really good and um so so basically it's um you know hundreds of years in the future um there's a guy who represents like the galactic confederacy of whatever the fuck and um they're all basically trying to like be able to trade with each other Uh so they want to persuade the folks on this planet where um it's very icy it's always winter basically they want to persuade the folks on this planet yeah you would (laughs) um to like become part of this trading agreement yeah um so they send a representative from earth and he gets there and he finds that um this this race of people um doesn't have um a sex. concept of gender yeah. yeah there's like there's no real concept of gender um pretty much everyone is born intersex meaning that they've got um like both sets of reproductive organs um so he gets there and the culture shock is real um and of course he brings all of his sort of like earth um sex and gender based biases to it um but he is then put in a position of himself like needing to survive and having to like form a companionship and like a, a good close relationship with one of these folks. Um, and it's his sort of journey of like forming this unlikely friendship, un- trying to understand who this person is, if they're not a man, if they're yeah, not a woman. Yeah, aside from gender. And I yeah, think at the time sure. when it was written, again, really ahead of its time, yeah. um, she probably got a lot of shit for it. For sure. <laughs> um, for sure. But yeah, it's this, I think there is something very utopian about this society. I mean, for me as a non-binary person, for sure, yeah. I see that as a utopia where no one's asking you to define yourself. Mm-hmm. No one's putting expectations on you to well, define yourself. Well, I think yourself. one of the reasons, right, that it will have got like a lot of shit at the time mm. will be because um, like our society, like that, we rely on that, right? Yeah. That's why when people are like oh I see myself as like outside of gender people panic Mm. uh, because they use that as like their immediate identifier to um okay I relate to this person in this way yeah um so you know men relate to men in a different way than men relate to women Mm. um and vice versa and so people people panic and Ursula Le Guin was basically saying you know what would you be if Mm. society hadn't told you you were a man or you were a woman you were a girl you were a boy who would you be oh. who would you be if you weren't pushed into this box yeah which you know is a question we're s- like still asking ourselves and still pushing people to ask you know who who are you if you're not that yeah and that makes people panic because it's so ingrained into who mm. they think they are yeah yeah, yeah. because that's just how our world works for sure and so her making people question that and suddenly people are thinking 
oh, I don't know who I am mm. outside of that. And that gives people a lot of fear. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's really interesting. I mm. really want to read it. You totally should. It's, it's really fun to read as well as like a creative writing student because she kind of, she world builds in such an interesting way where she'll like, um, one chapter will be like on the question of sex. It's like, what is it on this planet? And it will be, it will read like a scientific text. Okay, um, yeah, yeah. Or it'll be like um, uh, like a fable from um, a religious order. Um, it'll be like one of the one of the teachings of their holy book or whatever. It's really really interesting. Yeah, really fun. Nice. You should read it. I should read it for sure. Um, shall we talk about our tops and bottoms of last year? Yeah, tell me what you enjoyed last year. Okay, um, my. <laughs> My favourite book of last year. Okay, so firstly, this was really, really hard to decide. Um, yeah, I found it really difficult. And I feel like I have at least fucking five honourable mentions, but for for time's sake, I'm not going to honourably mention. Um, but my favourite book of last year was, and I don't, I actually don't know when this was published. Um, I think it was 2022. If work knowledge serves me. Oh, me. you're good. They're good. Um, so this is Our Wives Under the Sea by Julia Armfield. This cover is so grotesque and creepy. So pretty, though. And so beautiful at the same time. And I think that sums up the story really perfectly. <laughs> um, so basically, it's about um, a queer couple. They've um, been married and been together for eight years or so. Um, and the first chapter is from... Is it Mary? I want to say Mary. Yeah. First chapter is Mary, um, who is uh, the wife who has been at home waiting for Leah to come back from this submarine expedition because Leah's um, a marine biologist. Mm -hmm. And um, it starts when um, Leah's come back, but she's been away for months. Basically, she was missing. Yeah, and she um, shouldn't have been. Right? She shouldn't have been missing. Um, there was like barely any com communication between Mary and, you know, the center where, um, um, who Leah was employed with. Um, just no one knew what was going on. They basically lost contact with the submarine. Um, That's so my worst nightmare. Uh, genuinely a really have a real, scary like, thing about the ocean. Yeah, yeah. I really don't like the sea. I'm kind of the same in that it scares the shit out of me, but I also love it and I'm also mm -hmm. really interested in it. No, no. So like in another in another timeline, I am a marine biologist. No, no. In that timeline, I'm less chicken shit than I am in this timeline. I, we've we've definitely had a conversation about this. I think it was on New Year's <laughs> Eve when we have a few had a few bets. Yeah. Um, but the ocean really frightens me. Yeah. Um, and I don't know how much like people know. Um, but just for like fact's sake, um, as a species, as like people. Um, we have only ever explored um, 20 percent of the ocean 20 percent that is nothing like that's why yeah it's fucking crazy like 80 percent i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure this is also a fact but don't quote me on it just in case i don't know anything we've never set foot or thin <laughs> In eighty percent of our fucking ocean, <laughs> not a foot, nor fin. Oh my 80%. god, eighty percent. Yeah, but it's t it's genuinely terrifying. That's it's so scary. <laughs> I lose sleep over this. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching the other day. Like, why would you? Why would you? Just wha <laughs> why would you? I was watching the other day actually to calm myself down after having a bit of a menti bee. I was watching shark videos. No, <laughs> no. eighty. Yeah, that is mad. Um, have you ever seen any footage of like deep sea? Fish? I don't wish to. No. Okay. <laughs> That's very interesting. I don't wish to. No. No. All right. No. Oh, really. The ocean, it just, it frightens me. One episode. Can we please like, <laughs> can we just like show you pictures of like deep sea fish? No. And, and just Look, is that all gauge your reaction? And creepy. Yes. And, like, yeah. Yes. And it's why we love them. No, it's not. It really is. It's not. They're very scary. No. I love them. No. They're really toothy. No, it frightens me. Extremely toothy. The whole, and see-through a lot of the time. Me. Yeah. Anyway, um, so back to Our Wives Under the Sea. 
<laughs> so Leah's just come back and she's being really, really weird. Yeah, I would be really fucking weird if I was trapped <laughs> under, the, under the sea for that amount of right, time okay. against my will. <laughs> forget this. So she's, she's spending a lot of time in the bath. She is... Um, She's listening to like white noise sounds all the time. Yeah, well, you can't hear anything under the ocean. You're good, you. Yeah, well, you're good. And um, like, it's like you know when you put your ears under the water in the bath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everything's sort of distorted. Yeah, and it sort of just goes glug glug yeah, when you yeah, move. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Imagine that being all you could hear for months. No, I'm out. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so she's she's being really really odd, and like Mary's had to deal with the stress of not being able to see her all this time, and now she's having to work out what the fuck happened. Mm-hmm. Next chapter is Leah's story. So it into 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 multiple POVs versus yes, lovely multiple POVs. Um, so you get Leah when she starts to go on the exhibition running throughout what is happening now from Mary's perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's basically like, it's it's a thriller. It's um, it's really, really eerie. Um, but it's also this extremely moving love story of like these two people. Queer who, love story. Queer love we story. We love, we stand. We really do. Of like these two people who are clearly meant to be together. And one of them who like might have to let them go. And it is honestly one of the most heartbreaking books I have ever read, but I genuinely felt more whole for reading it. It was just stunning. So, so stunning. And also like another fairly short book. It's only got like 230 pages. Um, Yeah, I cried like a fucking baby when this ended. Oh my God. Yeah, she's really, really amazing writer. Like would highly recommend. It, this story meant a lot to me. It's one of my favourite books. Oh, Yeah, it really did. That's so cute. It was very beautiful. Good. I need to read yeah. it. Yes, you fucking do. This, I, how go. many? Sorry, how many times have I said that so far? How many times have both of us said that? We should have, like, a tally and, like, the the listeners at home can, like, drink every time someone says, oh, Shot I want to read every that. every time I need to read that. <laughs> Shot. You'll, be, you'll be wankered. <laughs> um, so true. I really struggled to pick a favourite. Yeah. Didn't we all, babes? Um, so i've got three okay i'm not going to talk about all three of them but i just feel the need to tell you that these were my three favorites okay um so um in third position (gasps) is cultish by amanda montel Mm. um in second position is now there was there was there was a fight for first position (laughs) i'm not gonna lie but in second position is i kiss shara wheeler by Casey McQuiston. Um, in the number one spot, which I will talk about, is Penance <gasps> by Eliza Clark. You fucking, the last time we talked about this, you sold the shit out of this to it's me. It's so, so good. Also, put the cover a bit closer because I feel like that's, it's it just is, a great cover. Um, so this, obviously you can't feel it. So um, on the cover, um, there's three girls sat with their um, back, to the the camera as it were um and one of them and this is the girl who dies in the book is scratched out in like biro um and i don't know if you can hear it because cover they've they've made it feel like someone's actually scratched it out <gasps> in biro oh my god that's so fun right Ooh. um it's really really clever oh, that's satisfying. it's like the the cover didn't look like this and someone's actually Cut gone along through every it. cover and scribbled onto it. Oh my god! Imagine. And I just think that's imagine a really... if that was your job. What great job! <laughs> I just think that's a really nice um, thing, and it's so it's sort of like um, it's on like the inside here as well. That little scribble, so it's sort of like become oh, no, the it. no, it's <laughs> sort of like become the the symbol of this book is like that scratch out in biro. Um, I did meet Eliza Clark, and she very kindly um, signed this book <laughs> for me. Um, she's drawn underneath her signature she drew um, a little like cartoon quick doodle of a crow nice um and i assume it's meant to be a crow and the crow has got a little speech bubble and he's screaming he's saying ah, ah. um and i i haven't asked to confirm um, <laughs> but i believe that um the reason for this is that the fictional town that this is set in is called crow on sea Ooh, so okay. there is like a little bit of a Connection. Connection. Um, so, 
Penance. Um, if you've read Eliza Clark's first novel, which was Boy Parts, which went um, viral on TikTok, yeah. actually, um, this is completely different. Completely different vibe, which I love. I love an author that can just write everything. Mm. Um, yeah. I think this book is a fucking work of genius. Um, so this is fictional, but it's written as though it's non-fic. Um, so when you read it, it reads like you're reading a true crime, mm-hmm. but it, none of this really happened. Okay. Um, we have an unreliable narrator. Love. Who is basically a washed up journalist. Mm. Um, and he's trying to revive his career by writing this, what he thinks is going to be this massive true crime novel. Okay. Um, and so he, he writes the true crime novel, which he names Penance. Oh, okay. Um, so this is his fictional true crime novel. Got it. Okay. Um, and it basically um, asks questions like who is benefiting from writing these true crimes. Mm-hmm. But there's, there's like this big interest in true crime shows and podcasts mm. and books. True crime's everywhere, right? It is. It's such a trend. Um, um, and yeah, it's sort of like how interested quote unquote do we get before we're sensationalizing these Mm. like horrific um, events that really happen to people Mm. right Um, and it asks questions like who gets to tell their story more importantly who doesn't get to tell their story Mm. Um, who is like assumed to be involved because of where they live or how they look or their family history Um, and how does money and status come into play when you're involved in a crime Mm. um and yeah it just it it really makes you think about what you're getting out of your interest in true crime and like i say ultimately who's benefiting from it that's really and it's really self-reflective and i think what i worry about with this book is that especially when i'm talking about it is that people who are into true crime will feel like a bit added yeah like called Um, out for it yeah um which I don't think is the um, intention. I think if you're interested in true crime kind of stuff, these are questions you should be asking yourself anyway. Yeah. No one's saying you can't be interested in that, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, but you should be critical of it. It is mm. an interest that you should be critical of and that you should question yourself about um, and that you should make sure that you're not... Um, like sensationalizing and taking too far and all of yeah. that stuff not sort of like turning something into trauma porn yeah for sure yeah um so yeah it's impeccable it's a work of genius go and read it we love it um yeah we love to see it 20 minutes later okay so we went for a little tea break um <laughs> and we have returned and we're going to talk about what we really didn't like in yeah. 2023 so um the funny thing about um us just having this little tea break was um that i was supposed to go and get a copy of the book that i really didn't like yes but um guess who already sold it second hand this bitch so <laughs> you're so, so confident you were like I it's know. downstairs no i know i can Let's see pause and I can where it, it was on my bookshelf two months the ago it left. i can see <laughs> <laughs> the dust it's gathering in mm-hmm. the gap on the bookshelf um okay so no you're you're, you're not gonna get a, a good look at the cover from this sorry guys um, but yeah so the book that i'm gonna rate my bottom of last year um is the hidden people by alison littlewood um now i just want to like blanket this i will not be the type of bookstagrammer who will ever like fucking slate a book if it's not really, really deserved. Like, I don't want to be, given that I'm an author, I don't also want to be the type of author that, like, slags off other authors. Yeah. You know? Whereas I feel like I'm pretty ruthless. Yeah. So, The Hidden People, yeah. Um, now, it's not that this book was bad. It really wasn't. Um, it's just that it's like a it's like a murder mystery, essentially. But I knew how it was going to end by the middle mm-hmm. of the book. And I fucking hate that. That shit. It, yeah. If you're going to do a murder mystery, you need to be a lot, lot cleverer than me. A lot. That's quite a low bar. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. I, I've been put in my place. Um, but yeah, like, so, so essentially what it's Yeah, if about, you can guess, you're bored. 
Yeah, a hundred percent. And if you're going to have like a, a like a bunch of different people who it could be, um, then then make it more convincing that it could be any of them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I'd like to have my money on like was a it the butler? Ones. It actually wasn't. I know. <laughs> so right. So this story, it's it's basically like. Um, it's folk horror, which I love. I fucking love folk horror. Um, for, for anyone who hasn't really heard of it before, um, lots of sort of the themes of folk horror include, um, like a rural setting, um, somewhere quite isolated, a small community, mm-hmm. sort of ancient traditions that no one really questions that could be questionable. Um, and like maybe like some, um, like, ghosts or spirits or like some curse that like comes back and and like haunts the people of the Mm -hmm. land or like haunts the newcomer um into the community um yes there's always an outsider that comes in there's a big trope of like an outsider that comes into whatever this situation is maybe they're someone from like the city or civilization so this story it was folk horror and also historical fiction which i know you hate Not a fan. No. Not a fan. Um, so it's set in Victorian era, and it's about this guy who um, he's got this cousin who he met when he was like a lot younger, mm-hmm. who he basically like became infatuated with. So she's like, he's like, oh my god, she's so pretty, and oh, I really fancy her. She would make such a wonderful wife. See, I'd have, you'd have lost me at that point. So I'd be like, dude, that's your cousin. Bye. Literally, first cousin Bye. as well. Vile. I mean, it may be legal, but it doesn't mean it's okay. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so this guy, um, he really sort of put her on a pedestal, and then like never saw her again until he hears of her untimely death, where um, it turns out she was burned to death on her own fireplace. Bye. By her husband. Excellent. Yeah. So um, he is naturally horrified by this. Obviously. And um, hears that there's not going to be a funeral. No one's going to be like making a to do about it, um, which is wild. As you do. Yeah. As you do. I mean, the husband is in custody, but no one's like, you know, hurrying up and getting their noose sorted, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so he decides to like go to the little village. It's like somewhere in Yorkshire. Um, and he basically tries to find out what happened. Why Why are all the other village people just being like... Village people. The villagers being like... Just uh, getting on with it. Yeah. Just, Someone's been burned to it. death. Yeah. Right, yeah. absolutely fine with it. Um, on with life, I guess. Yeah, in it, yeah. like just another day in Yorkshire. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you're from Yorkshire, please accept our sincerest apologies. <laughs> so, yeah, it's... It's a funny one. And basically, the the villagers believe in fairies. There's a hill um, that's just outside of the village boundary that everyone believes is like the fairy hill. So if you go there, you will be stolen by the fairies and you will become a changeling. So it turns <laughs> out that the villagers believed that um, that she became a changeling, this woman. And the husband was like, well, the way that you deal with a changeling is you that burn you, it. you kill them. And then the the real person will be released and will come back from what? being like, captured by the fairies. But they've burnt their body. How are they coming back? Well, they just believe that, that the fairy has like turned into what looks like the person, but isn't right. the person. I'm on it. Yep. Yeah. So um, he doesn't believe that that was his wife, basically. Right. Um, so, yeah. So he, he basically just investigates okay. the whole thing and is like, this is a bit fucking nuts, don't you think? Um, and, no. Um, no, apparently not. Um, but it just, yeah, it got to halfway through and I was like, oh, I know what's happening here. And then I got to the end and I was like, yes, yeah, I did know what was happening here. And it was just so dissatisfying. Shite. Shite. It wasn't shite. It was a good book. Written just, well. It was well written. But just... The the landscape, I could see it really clearly. A in bad mystery. Yeah, the mystery just wasn't. Especially mystery. if that's like if that's the your main part of the plot. Yeah. If it's like if it's just horror and you're just writing about like, you know, the folk horror, but if you yeah. if you've got a mystery element yeah. and your it's mystery be- falls flat. I again had a lot of bad reads. My least favourite Peach by Emma Glass. Um I bought it based on the cover. 
it's a great cover yeah it's a really pretty cover mm. um and maybe that was my first mistake however I, I did pick it up and i i read the synopsis and i found it really really interesting and i just ended up really disappointed by it and um, which is the worst yeah. I wish I hated it and it, that it had like no promise, but I think that was what made it so bad for me yeah. is that it started out so well and it started out with such great potential and then fell flat. That so sucks. Peach is a teenage girl okay, and she's walking home one day and she's sexually assaulted. Oh, okay. Um, and her world starts to sort of fracture and turn into something that it's not, right? Mm. Um, and every character in Peach's life is um, referred to as some sort of food stuff. Okay. Um, so she talks about her baby brother being made of sugar, okay. right? Because he's like sweet and, you know, all of that thing. Um, and obviously her name's Peach. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's this sort of running metaphor of food throughout the book, um, which I found really interesting and really, especially with this um, sexual assault that she goes through mm -hmm. and she sees the person who um, committed um, the sexual assault as like, almost like um, meat, right? Which I found really interesting because mm -hmm. it's, she, he's like greasy mm -hmm. and it's that sort of it's connotations good. of, yeah, exactly. It's like, like gross. It almost, yeah. 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 And like it stains and it's hard to get off and like, you have to like scrub it and Ooh. it like seeps into your clothes and yeah, it like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's it's cool. slimy. Right. It's, yeah. it's a fantastic metaphor. Yeah. Um, and then obviously you've got that um, contrasted with, Peach, this like sweet, innocent mm. um, young girl, and her baby brother, who's like sugary and sweet, yeah. and all of those things. And so it was, it was it, to me that like it started out really powerful. Premise. It was great, um, and then as the book went on, um, I feel like the author took the metaphor to glorious extremes, um, and the further she tried to take it the less it made sense. Oh, okay. Um, and so at the start of it, I was like, oh my God, this is an incredible metaphor. You know, mm. I feel like, I, I feel this, like you said, you can like feel it on your skin. It yeah, makes you yeah. like clam up and you like feel like your skin starts to crawl kind of mm. thing that like, um, and that's what a book should make you feel, right? Yeah, yeah. It should make you feel things. Um, and the further it got into the book, the less I felt it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I just feel like she took it too far and nobody sort of stepped in and said, you need to like back this up a little mm. bit, um, which I feel like really is an editor's job. Shall we wrap up here? Yeah. Fantastic. If you liked our show, please like, rate and subscribe as it'll help us reach more hectic bookworms. You can find us on Instagram at hectic.eclecticpod, on Twitter at the hectic pod, and on YouTube as the hectic and eclectic podcast. And you can send any suggestions, you know, fan mail, whatever you fancy, to hectic.eclecticpod at gmail.com, and um, any hate mail where it's Sunday, Sean. <laughs> <laughs>